In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Perpetual Help. That was the name Our Lady gave to this image. Our Lady herself. It was to a six-year-old girl in a Roman home where this title was first heard. This icon, having been miraculous for many centuries in the island of Crete, was taken by a merchant with the intent of bringing it to a church in Rome. It survived the wild tempest at sea and was entrusted to the family of the merchant's caretaker after his death. It was in the house of this family that Our Lady finally appeared to this little girl, giving the icon its name and instructing that it should be placed in the church of St. Matthew, where in 1499 it was finally placed and would be venerated for the next 300 years by the Roman people under the title given by Our Lady. But in 1798, revolution broke out, the church was destroyed, and the icon was saved, but placed in, obs in an obscure private chapel and remained there almost totally forgotten except for one of the original Augustinian friars from, this, from St. Matthew's. This friar, now old and nearly blind, told a young altar server these words, Make sure you know, my son, the image of the Virgin in the chapel. Do not ever forget it. It is a miraculous picture. After the friar's death, the young man always able always held a quiet devotion to the to the dust until the dust covered until to the dust covered forgotten image above the altar in a private chapel where he used to serve mass in 1855 the redemptorists without realizing it acquired the land in rome upon which upon which used to sit the old destroyed church they built their general house there, and one of the novices was that altar boy with the devotion to the forgotten icon. When a famous preacher came to Rome, he gave a sermon about a lost icon that was in St. Matthew's, which had been called the Virgin of Perpetual Help. That same altar boy, who had now become a redemptorist priest, upon, upon hearing this, knew precisely where the icon could be found. In 1865, the Holy See officially gave the custody of the icon over to the Redemptorists. It was the, the then Pius IX that gave them the now famous commission to make her known everywhere, a commission that was certainly heeded. The image was again publicly venerated in the church of St. Alphonsus, on the original land where she had been for 300 years. In 1867, the icon of Our, our Mother of Perpetual Help was solemnly, solemnly crowned by the Vatican with two, go, two crowns of gold and precious stones. Such a coronation was reserved for ancient images which had been instruments of extraordinary grace. At this coronation, coronation, the superior general of the Redemptorists solemnly swore that the crowns would never be removed. Since then, the Redemptorists have brought her image to nearly every country in the world and is truly the most widespread image of Our Lady in history. However, few know the story. We see that through divine providence, our Lady wanted the original image, not in the East, but in the West, in Rome. And we may ask, why Rome? It is said to be Our Lady's cry to the East, to those still separated after a millennium of schism. You must look, to, you must look West, West to the Vicar of Christ, West to the seat of authority, West to where Our Lady chose to appear so many times in the last two centuries and perform her greatest miracles because unity lies only in union with Rome. 
But we as Latin Catholics, icons in general, are not as familiar to us as they are in the East. Firstly, we must know that icons are not paintings. They are visual scripture. Their makers are not called painters, but writers. And so icons are not just rep a representation of the subject in the icon, but a window. The icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help is primarily in the style of Hodegetria, which means one who shows the way. The icon also contains within it the entire story of salvation and contains all the elements of the future fifth Marian dogma, which is tied to the coming of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mary is co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. We see these three roles interwovenly, interwoven symbolic, symbolically again and again when we look at her icon. We see this at the right hand of Our Lady, her fingers pointing to Jesus. Not only that, but if we were to make a direct line from her longest finger, we can see that she's pointing directly to the heart of our Lord. As we know, she is the only way to the heart of Christ. Since our Lord came by her in history, and God only does things in the perfect way, and never does them in any other way, Christ then always only comes to us by Mary. And likewise, she is our way back to him. We see our Lord has both of his hands, his palms down into Mary's open hand. And here he's showing the entire order of mercy has been placed into Mary's hands, giving her authority. Her left hand is holding our Lord, but not in a way that she's keeping him to herself, but as if she was offering him to us. She wears a dress of dark red, and in the Byzantine world of the 15th century, this was the color of the empress, the queen, that along with her crown indicates that she is that queen mother always mediating with the king as Bathsheba, as Bathsheba, Bathsheba did with Solomon, sitting at the right hand of her son, who tells her what Solomon told his mother, ask mother, and I will grant it to you. When we ask God for something, we might not always receive it. When, we ask our, when Our Lady asks on our behalf, as Queen, she always receives. And so we see consecration to her is most necessary for flourishing in the spiritual, the spiritual life and ultimately for salvation. Since the Queen herself is totally and completely responsible for the fate of those souls. She also wears a cloak of dark blue, which like purple, symbolizes penance. And we could see this in many of her apparitions like Fatima and Lourdes. She's always calling for penance. As she herself was the cooperator with Christ in the act of redemption, taking upon her own soul the suffering of her own son. On her head, is an eight-pointed star, which has always been a symbol of Mary, pointing not only to the star of Bethlehem, which guided the wise men to the place where she was with the divine child, but also indicating Mary as the star of the sea, Stella Maris. As we pass through this life, only the stormy oceans of time, we hopefully will seek guidance from this star. And so we should be in the boat with Peter, the church, whose main navigating point is the star of Mary, guiding the ship to the port of Christ.
The morning star is also the star that precedes the morning sun. Mary preceded her son in time to prepare a worthy dwelling for his coming. Christ's coming is always predicated on Mary, whether it be in prayer or in the Blessed Sacrament or even at the end of time. We see Mary's eyes in the image are looking not at anything or anything at not at anything or anyone else in the icon, but to you. She gazes deep into your eyes with a tender yet sad look. As the mother of sorrows, she sees all the future suffering that she and her son would bear. She saw it at the Annunciation when she said yes to it. It, could, it can also be called a cradle pieta, our lady grieving not with the dead, but with the living, Christ in her arms. Although her head is inclined towards Christ, her eyes are looking out to us with compassion as the aching members of Christ's mystical body sharing in his sufferings. This glance calls to mind the Salve Regina. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. By looking into her eyes, it is she who is communicating with you. It is she who is seeing your needs and wants, she who notices. This is the mother who had only to see, to notice that there was no wine at the, at the wedding feast of Cana. And by a single word from her, our Lord performed the miracle that gave them the best wine. Whatever she sees, whatever misery in your heart, in your soul, whatever needs that are on your mind, written on your face, dare I say, even before you ask for help, just like the needs of the couple at the wedding, she goes to her son and she brings them to him. Those eyes are the eyes of a mother who offers perpetual help to all she sees before her in need. They are the eyes of the mediatrix of all graces, whose perpetual help always consists in mediating every request and bringing them to the feet of her divine Son. It was Our Lady's perpetual help at the foot of the cross that enabled St. John to be the only one of the twelve standing at the foot of the cross. And so it is that she enables us to stand and endure our crosses. And in speaking of the relationship between our crosses and our model co-redemptrix, Our Lady, St. Louis de Montfort says, it is quite true that the most faithful servants of the Blessed Virgin, being also her greatest favorites, receive from her the greatest graces and favors of heaven, which are crosses. It is the servants of Mary, then, who carry these crosses with more ease, more merit, and more glory. The angels Michael and Gabriel are present both to the left and to the right, presenting the instruments of the Passion, not just to our Lord, but to Our Lady. But through Mary's eyes, these angels present these instruments to you. And she seems to ask what she asked at Fatima. Will you accept? Will you suffer with us so as to save souls? She is presenting us with the opportunity to be, to be many co-redeemers with Christ. We also see in the image, Saint Gabriel carries the cross and the nails of the Passion and is seen to be bowing on the same level as Mary, indicating how he bowed to her at the moment of the Incarnation. Saint Michael carries the sponge, the bowl of gall and vinegar, and the lance that pierced Christ's side. Both carry these in instruments with veiled hands, 
indicating the holiness of the instruments of our, of our redemption. St. Michael also has a stripe on his sleeve, indicating his rank and authority among the angels. Even Our Lady's ear in the icon could have been covered, but it's not. It is exposed and turned, turned towards you, listening, waiting, longing for you to ask what you need. Tell her your troubles, and she will offer you her perpetual help. We recall in Scripture the woman who cries out, saying to our Lord, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. To which our Lord responds, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. The smallness of Our Lady's mouth indicates that we as Our Lady's children must always be silent in order to hear the word of God who speaks to us in the silence of our hearts. Our Lord's green tunic is a symbol of his humanity, and the golden brown tunic, a symbol of his divinity, the resurrected body. The red cincture indicates humanity itself, that it has been wrapped in his redemptive love. Our Lord in the icon is not looking at us, but looking away, not so much to the angel Gabriel, but almost past him, but to a point beyond the icon, perhaps to the passion itself, to the future reality of all the, le the elect in heaven who would enter into paradise by the price he would pay. Perhaps he's instructing us to meditate on his passion as he is. We can see in the cross legs of Christ the image of the future crucifixion. His legs are crossed one over the other as they would be in the, on the cross. The symbol of the sandal falling is his foot, off his foot, tells two stories. The first is that the falling sandal is a sign of his humility, which we hear in Scripture. Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. The golden sandal falling off his foot is a symbol of his glory, his divine nature, which he conceals in order to take on human form. The other story goes that our Lord was given a vision of all that he would have to suffer as a child. And as the body has a natural repugnance to death, to the separation of the soul, he in reaction leapt into his mother's arms, as all children do when they're frightened, so fast that it is shown that the sandal is hanging off his foot. Mary was his comforter, as so she is to us. She takes the name of her spouse, who is also called the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. We should, like Christ, then, leap into her arms and place our cares into her hands. Here, God himself, as a child, showing us how to become children of Mary, totally reliant. Given all this, we should see to follow the Great Commission of blessed Pope Pius IX. Make her known everywhere. So that is what we must do. Let us make her known everywhere. Let us place the image of her in our homes. There was once a time where this image was so common among Catholic homes, one of her titles was Mother of Catholic Homes. May we all revive that practice. As we could close tonight after Mass, we'll be praying in front of this beautiful icon of our Mother of Perpetual Help. This icon was touched to the original in Rome. 
and you will all have the opportunity to come up and venerate her image. Follow the example of Christ and leap into her arms. Place your hands in hers as he did, palms down in complete submission. Whatever it is, whatever your petition, whatever your requests, give it all to her, your mother, who will always help you in all things perpetually. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.